<laughs> I, I hope you all can really appreciate how excited I am to be back and to be on the mend, and I'm glad you're all here. Good morning, Paul. Uh, in the spring of 1959, an Air Force major entered a Texas mental institution for the second time. He had tried to commit suicide twice, and he had been arrested for forgery and robbery. For years, he had been drinking heavily, and his marriage had disintegrated. Yet only 15 years before, he had been a model military officer headed for a promising career. One momentous event could be noted as the catalyst for the major's downward spiral. He flew the plane that dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima. Shortly after, he began to have dreams haunted by throngs of Japanese men, women, and children, and his own life began to collapse. The psychiatrist who treated him said that he was subconsciously trying to bring punishment on himself from society to atone for the guilt he felt over that bombing. Unresolved guilt was destroying his life. Now, a few of us suffer such extreme levels of guilt, but we all do experience guilt. And sometimes we equate guilt with shame. And I want to point out that they are not the same thing. All of us need to learn how to embrace and employ our feelings in ways that are helpful to our lives rather than harmful. Today I'm beginning a new series of messages that focus on our emotions and the fact that each emotion that we experience has a God-based origin. The series is loosely based, and in, by saying that I say I'm going to use some of the scripture that I found in a series written by a man named David Owens, who preaches at a Church of Christ in New York. Um, I'm not preaching his messages, I'm just using some of his scripture. Uh, had I not needed surgery, I would have preached two weeks ago a message based on Ecclesiastes chapter 3. That's the familiar text in which the author, by the way, he was the wisest man in history, Solomon. In that text, he reminds us that there is a time, a season for everything under the heavens. I want us to understand that includes our emotions. As a baseline for the series, I agree with David Owens in his suggestion that we need to avoid two extremes with regard to our emotions. First of all, we need to avoid burying them and hiding them because we care what society around us, around us thinks. Number two, we need to avoid allowing our emotions to control our lives because emotions are simply that. They are feelings. They have a purpose, but their purpose is not to control everything that we do. As we know from both mental health studies and by simply seeing the after effects in the world around us, both of those extremes can have disastrous outcomes. God has given us the capacity to feel these emotions, and when dealt with through a biblical lens, we will see that our emotional health and well-being is reached and maintained at its greatest level through our relationship with God, through his Son and his Word. This is where we learn what our emotions are for and how we use them to our best. It's through our relationship that we experience grace, forgiveness, freedom in Christ, a spiritual family that provides a sense of belonging, truthful self-image, and true joy. I want to go back and say truthful self-image because that is where it all starts, especially when the emotion of guilt is concerned. Each week as we examine one of our emotions, we'll explore how that emotion is given 
to us for our well-being and how we can allow God to use it in our lives for his glory. Because when our lives are on track with his plan, that is for his glory. As I've already mentioned today, we're going to take a biblical look at the emotion of guilt, which can lead to a sense of shame. I'm going to use a number of scriptural texts for the message. Some of them are not going to make us feel immediately really, really good about ourselves. The one I've chosen as the core text, though, is one that gives hope and encouragement. In your bulletin, you will notice it says Hebrews 10, 19 through 22, which says, oh, by the way, I'm back. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Listen to these words. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Our faith and our hope are directly linked to our understanding that we have been cleansed by the blood of Christ. That not only has our sin been washed away, but also, as it says here, that our conscience has been cleansed. Cleansed of guilt. The reason I say that some of the other texts that we'll be looking at today may not make us feel good about ourselves is because they point us to that need for Christ's cleansing blood. Because you can't get here until you've been there. Until you come to some certain conclusions about your life. Once we've heard the gospel message, once the blinders that this world and the enemy put on us are removed, and until we surrender our lives in obedience to the gospel, we are guilty as charged. You can see the scriptures up there. The first one is the Hebrews one that we already read. The rest of those are ones that we will get to as we go through the message. You are free to make note of those if you would like um, so that you can uh, further investigate in the future. The scripture that we've already read is the end result of obedience. We're cleansed of our feelings of guilt. And this is a great place, a great point in the message for me to point out that what we're talking about here is the emotion of guilt. We're not talking about the state, the actual state of guilt. There's a difference there. The emotion of guilt is a feeling that we feel. The state of guilt is having been judged for something that you've done. That's what makes guilt such a difficult emotion to deal with. It's possible to be guilty of something, which is defined as a violation of a law or an offense against another person. It's possible to be guilty and yet not feel guilt. It's also possible to feel guilt when you actually aren't guilty of anything. I'd suggest that each of us knows Someone, at least one person, who can manipulate your emotions and bring you to a point of feeling guilty when you've actually done nothing wrong. We'll see throughout this series that the same principle applies to most, if not all, of our emotions. As for being actually guilty and not feeling a sense of guilt... The Bible points to two reasons that that might be so. One is willful disobedience. The other is ignorance. I don't know how you feel about being called ignorant, but I would rather be called ignorant than willfully disobedient. We're going to look at what Jesus himself has to say about those things. Another point that needs to be made is that the majority of mentions in, of guilt in Scripture, and particularly in the New Testament, deal specifically with the state of guilt as it relates 
to man's sin against God and the emotion of guilt that humans feel because of our recognition of that sin and our acknowledgement of that sin. That's why I said that without recognition and acknowledgement, it's impossible for us to experience the cleansing that we read about in that first scriptural passage. That also explains why there are so many more references to guilt in the ancient Old Testament scriptures than there are in the New Testament. If you have an NIV Bible, there are 189 references, 189 times that something from the original transcript is translated to guilt. 189. 174 of those are in the Old Testament. I know you know math, so 15 of them are in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there are references to man's guilt of sin against God, the Israelites' offenses against one another, and the remedy for having sin against God erased, which was the guilt offering. There are even prescribed methods of dealing with the times when a person is guilty of something and he or she doesn't even realize it at the time, but later becomes aware of it. Let me say that again. It's possible to commit a sin against God and not know it. But when you figure it out, you have to do something about it. You can't just say, well, I didn't know. We not only have to recognize and acknowledge our guilt, both as a state of being and an emotion, we also have to be able to determine, discern and determine where the emotion is coming from. That's important too. You see how difficult emotions are to navigate when you're looking at them through a godly lens? Because we can make up all kinds of reasons of why we feel guilty or why we don't feel guilty, but we're gonna point out for, through scripture what is actually happening there? You may have heard that guilt comes from the enemy. Anybody ever heard that from a preacher? Guilt comes from the enemy. You have nothing to feel guilty about. That's just Satan. There's some truth to that at some point in your Christian walk. For those who are in Christ, that can certainly be true. The devil's very good at telling us that we aren't worthy of forgiveness that our sins are too great, that our faith is too weak, that God is too busy, or that he simply doesn't care about you and me. The devil might put those thoughts in your head. He's very good at reminding us of our shortcomings and our setbacks. He's also very good at using other people. I know you don't want to hear this, but even other Christians to perpetuate our feelings of guilt. That's why it's so very important for you and for me to know what Jesus says about our state of guilt and our feelings of guilt because emotions are, an area, are part of our human makeup and we know that they originated with God. I'm convinced that God enables us to feel guilt, feelings of guilt, to initiate a change in our lives and a change in our relationship with him. I believe that's the godly use of guilt. How can we acknowledge sin if we don't feel some way about it? It has to make us feel some way before we're going to acknowledge that it's there. And don't misunderstand, admitting we're sinners is absolutely the first step. Amen? Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the starting point to get to that cleansing that's available to each and every one who would accept it. You have to admit that. If every word of the Bible is not true, we're wasting our time, church. Church. 
For any or all of this to make sense, we first have to believe that what we read in Scripture is true. And once we've reached that conclusion, we see that God's Word also gives us a prescribed method for how to deal with guilt. Guilt that comes from knowing we've sinned. I mentioned earlier that God recognizes the difference between willful disobedience and ignorance where sin is concerned. And that difference is dealt with directly by Jesus himself in the Gospel of John. If you want to turn to John chapter 9, there's an account of Jesus healing a blind man on the Sabbath. And the reaction of the religious leaders who don't think that should take place on that day. After interacting with these Pharisees, Jesus ends the discussion with these words in verse 41 of John chapter 9. Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Hmm. Then in chapter 15, John records what Jesus says about the world's reaction to Jesus himself in verse 22, it says, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. And verse 24 of the same chapter says, If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they hated both me and my Father. Let me paraphrase those last three verses for you and make it really, really simple. In their ignorance, they're not guilty. Once they see the truth, they're guilty. What does that tell us, church? Once they've been shown the truth, there's no excuse for their sin. That's the biblical difference between ignorance and willful disobedience. When I was in the restaurant business, I always, always, always stressed the importance of training and communication. And I'm sure any of you that have been in the business world have heard those things stressed many, many times. You know why? Because you cannot be held accountable for what you don't know. There it is. But once you know, you must be held accountable. The Old Testament law was given to the Israelites so they would be aware of what God desired from them and there was a system of sacrifices in place that included the guilt sacrifice to serve as atonement. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't permanent. It was an annual offering and it was made on behalf of the people by the priest and since it was made annually, that tells us that it had limited power. As we know, or you may not know, but the fact is Jesus changed all that. He not only lived as a man and taught of the need for and availability of a pardon from the guilt of sin, he also became the sacrifice necessary to make that a possibility. We read that passage from Hebrews 10, and I'm going to read it again. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. That's great news for us. And if you go back and you read chapter 10 of Hebrews from the beginning, it tells of the absoluteness of this sacrifice in contrast to the temporary fix offered by the Old Testament guilt offering. So here's what it boils down to. If you know the truth and you've admitted your need for a Savior and if you've accepted Jesus as that Lord and Savior, your guilty conscience can know relief. Relief. 
You can say with confidence, as David did in Psalm 32, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and whose spirit and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. The emotion of guilt brought on by the knowledge of our sin can lead to repentance, confession, and obedience. And once you've experienced that cleansing that the author of Hebrews wrote about, you can be free of guilt. Free to live out God's plan for your life. But you must keep in mind that the enemy will do his best to bring those feelings back into your mind. His aim is twofold. He wants to distract you from God's plan, and he wants to plant doubt concerning your salvation. Don't entertain those thoughts. If you've been obedient to the gospel, you've confessed your sin, you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, put that away. You don't have time for it. You have other things to occupy your mind. Cling to all of the encouragements that we find in Scripture. Here's one more. 1 John 1, 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Do we believe that, church? Every word of the Bible is true. I want to point something out here. I believe that this scripture tells us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, means we have fellowship with God. Because we are walking in the light with God. If you are walking in the light with God, you got no time for what the devil's trying to put in your mind. Those feelings of guilt will be cleansed, washed away. As I said and I keep saying, it's only when we believe in the truth of the Word of God that we can have assurance that leads to a clear, guilt free conscience. As I also said earlier, if you don't know, you don't know. But Jesus himself says if you do know, there is no excuse for your sin. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. Cleanse our guilty consciences. Put your word, your thoughts, your meditations into our minds so that we can Keep those thoughts at bay. We know that the enemy will continue to try to distract us and discourage us, but we also know that your word is true. That these feelings of guilt that we have for the sins that we've committed, the sins that we've confessed and been forgiven of, those feelings are no longer valid. So thank you for Jesus, for the sacrifice, for making a way for us to escape that guilt and be forgiven of our sins. And Father, I just pray that we continually look inside ourselves and when there is a need, a time for confession and repentance, that we would do that on a regular basis so that we can keep our consciences free of guilt and focused on you, your son, and eternity. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.